As one of the numbered editions, the Standard H Defender watch box serves as a salute to our military as well as a nod to one of my absolute favorite vehicles of all time, the Land Rover Defender. Tireless energy has gone into the transformation of a 50 caliber ammo can into a luxurious product. The box's 8 watch capacity is perfect for those with smaller collections or those traveling with a subset of a larger group. The Defender Watch Box willfully serves as your watch's go-to companion for attending watch meetups or carrying a select arsenal on a trip. Though the name of the watch box derives from a Land Rover, the details stem from more than one vehicle in a true Standard H fashion. The inside houses two wooden trays handmade by artisans in Florence, Italy from poplar wood and then elegantly lined in the same Alcantara suede found in GT-level Porsches and 99% of modern supercars. This plush detail is the exact type of accommodation your timepieces deserve. The padded diamond pattern under the box's lid is a nod to the seat designs found in Mercedes G-Wagons as well as the Koenigsegg Agera R. Also inside is a bespoke aluminum owner's plate displaying your name and box number. Included is a certificate of authenticity I personally fill out and hand emboss with a Standard H logo. The subtle shift logo badge on the outside is made from cast white bronze in the age-old lost wax tradition of jewelry making, then antiqued and hand polished. Each Defender watch box is made to order and placed in a wooden crate that I build and paint in my garage, which will no doubt be a fun event for you to open with the included miniature pry bar. Available in three iterations, the watch box comes in signature Standard H Garage Collection Stealth, which is black with gray interior for a sleek modern aesthetic, OD green with cognac interior for a true military look, and omakase where no two purchases are the same. You and I will exchange an email regarding your personal preferences, which will aid in the completion of your Defender watch box and crate as a departure from the normal offering. As an added bonus, 10% of each OD Green purchase is donated to Heart and Armor, which is a foundation focusing on veteran health. As always, thank you so much for supporting Standard H. Today I welcome Watchinista's Josh Shanks, and we begin in a way I certainly didn't expect. We talk about the birth of snowboards. We then go into the car culture of Indiana, and then his career, which was utterly unpredictable. Josh went from working retail at Apple, thanks to an early Mac-specific blog he wrote, to then take his technological prowess down the path of private equity and hedge funds. Josh shares a vacation that would effectively change his life forever. You see, he had no idea the rabbit hole he was about to go down when he purchased a Rolex in place of the watch that he broke on that trip to the Bahamas. And I'm fairly confident he wasn't predicting he'd marry a woman from Switzerland that worked for Richemont and encourage him to also work in watches. But life sure does take some strange serendipitous turns sometimes, and Josh's story offers no exceptions. In his current role as editor-in-chief of Watch Anista, Josh is looking to create watch content that isn't what you usually see and read, with an intense focus on the collector community, which is a much smaller subset than most would think. Josh also weighs in on hype culture and how it's affected the watch collecting community, and he even gives us a glimpse behind the curtain of those awesome looking Oris gatherings in Vail, Colorado. All of that and more in what was really a fun conversation, so please enjoy it. I'm your host, Wesley Smith, and you're listening to the Standard Age Podcast. Well, Josh, thanks so much for taking the time to be on the podcast. I really appreciate you doing it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. um, You are familiar with the pod, I believe. So you're probably also familiar with how we start. So you want to take it away? (laughs) Where were you born, Josh? Where were you born? Uh, I was born in Newport Beach, California. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. What, uh, What did your parents do there? So my dad was a mold maker. And my mom was basically kind of a nurse slash back office at a hospital. Okay, so a mold maker. Yeah, so he he's always specialized in pla- plastic injection molds. So sure, um, you know, so he honestly one of his claims to fame, I guess, is that he helped invent the snowboard uh, way back in the day with Burton. No kidding. So he worked at this small place called Pre Production Plastics, I believe, in Long Beach, California, and they uh, they helped to kind of usher in this snowboard with Burton. They designed it. They designed all the production and everything like that. And I think a running family joke that we have is, you know, 
what was there like a payment option where like you got like a flat fee or per board because you probably should have taken the per board fee you know yeah. you know they were paying me an hourly fee so you know i just i just kind of took it so I'm like oh man we kind of missed out on our snowboard empire you know wow that's insane wow that's that's pretty well, well what else did he focus on then so obviously snowboards but snowboards a lot of uh, medical device you know manufacturing so sure. everything from um his company you know, we moved to indiana which is my parents, which is where my parents grew up before they moved to California. And we moved to Indiana and uh, he was working at a, a medical device manufacturer and they helped invent the skin graft machine wow. actually. So it was super cool. And that was, you know, I remember going to his office and seeing all these AutoCAD drawings and these huge drafting boards and, you know, they were making the skin graft machine right there. And, you know, that's where I kind of, you know, come and I have an engineering background as, you know, with my dad and, you know, we've always been tinkering around cars and model rockets and RC planes and all kinds of stuff like that. Oh, amazing. What, uh, what kind of car exposure did you get in Indiana? Indiana, I mean, it's a kind of a huge car culture. Obviously yeah. it doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it, it's completely different than what we see up here in Connecticut and New York city with like your Porsches, Ferraris, and you know, this kind of high end car culture. Whereas Indiana, like we were always like, you know, just tinkering and, you know, we always just kind of had this mentality of, you know, mechanics. Right. So like, and I grew up in a Volkswagen family. So, you know, I grew up in, because I grew up in Southern California. My dad was always tinkering on Volkswagen bugs and he had a, you know, a, a 68 Beetle. He had a 73 Super Beetle. Um, you know, he drove his Raspberry 68 Beetle back to, back to Indiana when we moved, moved back um, shortly after, I think it was around right after the Rodney King riots and whatnot, we moved back to, back to Indiana. And yeah, so because the car had zero heat and because it's on heater channels, you obviously can't drive it in the Midwest. Right. Um, and so my dad kind of opted, I think for, you know, the more safer option of like a Honda Civic. Um, but you know, car culture was always in our veins. So when I became of age and when I was 16, I think at the time my dad was driving a 93 Geo Metro. No kidding. You know, it was a four door Geo Metro hatchback, uh, a hatchback uh, in Maroon. Um, it was a great car. I got 53 miles to the gallon, little three cylinder <laughs> engine, like 53 horsepower, I think too. Yeah. But he gave me this car and, you know, when I was 16, I got, you know, I got my learner's permit, got my license. He gives me the car and I'm like, dad, this car is shit. Like this, this is terrible. Like I can't drive this. He's like, well, I guess you better get a job then. Wow. And so I pretty much that day, my mom drove me around, around town and we went to a fried chicken place and we went to another place that was run by a family friend called Pizza King, which was a local pizza shop. And my mom went in there and she was like, can you, can you give my son a job? I think it was 15 or so. Or so. And he's like, yeah, you know, we, we can do that. Um, can, you know, make five fifty an hour. Can you start tomorrow? I'm like, sure, I'll be here. And I worked there all summer, saved up enough money to buy a 87 Pontiac Fiero GT. Oh, no kidding. The Fiero. I love that car. I was obsessing over the Fiero and, you know, but the one that I got was purchased from some, you know, auto dealer down in Indianapolis thing had 187,000 miles on it. When I bought it, the engine was almost shot. Like it's, you know, I think it lost its reverse gear on the way to, you know, back home from Indianapolis. Cause I grew up in a small little town called Kokomo, Indiana, which is kind of home to a lot of automotive culture. So uh, Kokomo, Indiana was the home to Elwood Haynes who, technically invented the first uh, self-powered automobile, you know, with Haynes, Haynes Apperson Automotive. Um, but it was Henry Ford that produced the first mass produced automobile. Um, so Indiana's or Kokomo, Indiana has this claim to fame that they're called the city of firsts. Um, so they invented stainless steel there. Jeez. We invented the, the stoplight. We invented the transistor radio. Uh, so they've got a lot of firsts in Indiana and it was always home to auto manufacturing. So GM and Delco made all of GM's car radios, uh, for decades in Kokomo, Indiana and Chrysler made all of their transmissions for all of their trucks in Kokomo, Indiana. And they still do too, to this day. Oh, wow. I love how you create a car, then you create order by creating a stoplight and then you create distraction by creating a radio. <laughs> exactly. And they're also home to the most restaurants per capita of anywhere in the U S no and kidding. the only cracker and the only cracker barrel that's not located on an interstate. Interesting. Well, cracker barrels solid. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so what were you doing in high school other than working? Like what were you into? Were you into sports or what were your hobbies? Yeah, I, I tried, I tried to be in sports. I think like any kid, I wanted to be an astronaut and I wanted to be Michael Jordan. Um, neither worked out. I got my, um, when I was in 
when I was in, you know, basically junior high, I was a member of a flying club called the Flying Squirrels. Okay. My ch- my childhood hero was Chuck Yeager. Sure. And I wanted I wanted to be a test pilot. I wanted to be on the right stuff, and I wanted to do that. Um, so I got my pilot's license when I was sixteen. You know, on a Cessna 172, uh, just I was just day rated. I wasn't anything special. Um, so I and I, I've never really kept it up into being an adult now. Um, but so I was super interested in that. And my dad was honestly my best friend growing up. So like any hobby that I was into, he was into with me. And so from working on cars to model airplanes to remote control airplanes to control line airplanes to model rockets to coin collecting to stamp collecting, like. It runs the gamut. And I think, you know, I grew up with like a severe case of ADHD. So like we were all over the place with like what our hobbies were at any given moment. And, you know, it was always my parents and my dad, you know, just pushing to be like, okay, you're into this now. Okay. Let's go do that. You know? And until finally something stuck and I tried playing sports. I was the tallest guy on the team and I'm five, nine and I would play basketball and I was the center for the team. (laughs) Terrible. (laughs) So I was just, I think we were like two and 13 uh, for the Western High School Panthers. You're like the Hoosiers then. Yeah, and and so it wasn't until my junior year that I didn't really knew, know what I wanted to do when I grew up. Obviously, I still don't, but um, one of the biggest things was, you know, I kept getting more and more into technology, and uh, I discovered this Mac computer at my dad's um, machine shop, and he, they had it in an attic, and, you know, I was like, oh, these, you know, Macintosh computers, it was still like back in the day, this was like the early 90s, they were nowhere near what PCs and Windows were. And, and I was like, I think I just want to play on computers for the rest of my life. I think that's what I want to do. And they put me kind of, I, we found this vocational school where I would spend half the time at, you know, in high school, and then half the time at a vocational school. And it was a vocational school for basically graphic design and computers. I mean, they didn't, everything kind of was in the same silo back then they had no idea what to do of what to do with all these computer kids yeah. um so we all kind of got bucketed into this graphic design program which was amazing like it, it really set the course for me to be into technology into design into art um and so we were doing like you know we were doing our own photo developing we were doing um three color print presses we were doing silk screening of t-shirts we we're i mean we we're doing all kinds of things in this vocational program but right down the hall was a mechanic shop so you know these guys uh, you know on, on our lunch breaks we're going over there and working on cars and then we're going to a wood shop so that that was really cool and taught me actual practical skills because a lot of the other other stuff just didn't really resonate with me yeah well that's really cool so then where did you end up going to college so I, um, when I was, when I was in high school, I always worked multiple jobs. So like I worked at, um, I worked at a silk screen company. I worked at, uh, electronics boutique, which is now GameStop. I worked at Sears selling tools. So I was a tool apprentice at Sears. Uh, and then after that, I was like, okay, well, I definitely want to be, you know, in somewhat, you know, in a technology background of some, of some kind. So I went to this little school, uh, down in Indianapolis that was part of, it was, I think now it's called Bradford Schools, but back then it was called International Business College, and it was by no means an international business college. <laughs> it was, you know, it was nothing to write home about from a college standpoint. But I, I've met some of my best friends there, and I still keep in touch to this day. But when I was in college, uh, I got a part-time job at the Apple Store, and this was back in 2002. I think Apple stock was like four dollars a share, um, and you know we were all slinging iPods, and this is before the iPhone, before anything. Yeah, I had one of the original ones from like, I think it was 2001, maybe. Yeah, I was the little geeky 19 year old that probably sold it. You know, it's that's what it was back in the day. That's cool with the wheel that actually rotated. I mean, when I started working at Apple, the iPod wasn't even introduced. Uh, We were selling Rio players and Macs. And yeah, it would be a good day if we sold like a computer and, uh, you know, a music device. That was it. Like, I mean, Apple had no idea what they were doing back back in the day when it comes to retail, but they knew they needed to have a presence in retail. So. Oh, wow. That's crazy. So did you stick with them after college? You Or that was your job after college? Uh, no, my job after college, I so I still worked at the Apple store part time um, as an iPod specialist, I think. Oh, that's funny. I went, um, I got a full time gig as a graphic designer at a college furniture company. Uh, and it was called University Loft, and they made collegiate and military dorm room furniture. And wow. I was their graphic designer. I was doing all their catalogs and all their photo shoots and everything. And um, I wasn't very good at it. I was terrible. Like I was just I, I didn't have a design mindset to like consistently produce. And I was always like 
overthinking every single problem as it came to my desk and thinking I would was going to reinvent the wheel with this new furniture catalog. And you're like, no, just we just want to stamp the same thing that we did last year, but with new pictures. I'm like, no, I'm going to reinvent the wheel. And this is we're going to reinvent the art of catalog. I, I was just failing at every level. And Apple came and they're like, well, listen, we want we want you full time. Uh, we'll pay you more than you make now. And it's like, sold <laughs> like whatever I yeah. can do. Um, and so, yeah, I worked my way up at Apple. I actually ended up working for them for six years. Um, I worked from, you know, Indianapolis to Chicago to San Francisco. Uh, and then ultimately I caught a break and they were opening this Fifth Avenue Apple store in New York. I'd never even been to New York as a kid from Indiana. Um, so I packed up everything I had. Uh, I, I, I had a house in Indiana of all things. Like, you know, that was back before the recession. So they, they were given houses away basically. Right. I had a house that I packed up and I moved to a, I moved to New York to an apartment I found on Craigslist. I sold my car. Um, and I've been in New York ever since, and that's been about 15 years ago. Oh, wow. So, so that's the cube store, like in front of the old FAO yeah. shorts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was one of the first people to, you know, to work at that store. And then I basically kind of worked my way up where I was working in retail, but then I had a, you know, a, a training job at their corporate HQ at the Citigroup building, um, w- which is where Apple was back in the day. I remember Steve Jobs, like actually had an office in there and it was like, you know, completely off limits and, you know, double locked and everything. I, was, I always thought that was so cool. But wow. yeah, I mean, Apple, Apple was amazing in, in my career, at least. Um, and, you know, just unfortunately back then they really, you know, the corporate side of the business and the retail side of the business just didn't really mesh together. And it was really hard to advance within within the ranks there. And yeah, so I ended up, I ended up leaving to go work at an advertising company in in IT, basically. Why do you think they didn't mesh? Was that because of like the sort of scatterbrained nature and artistic side of Steve, you think? And then, whereas like a retail structure usually demands just that is a lot of structure. Well, retail definitely demands a lot of structure, but Steve was very hands-on. I mean, Steve was picking everything from the music that they played in the stores to the t-shirts. I remember there was this one thing uh, where, you know, they had ordered all these t-shirts and Steve hated the the size of the logo on the shirts. And so he did a massive like 500 store recall of these shirts. So like, you know, all the stores were sent to the shirts and by the next day they were all sent right back to Cupertino. How, what, what was the size of the logo? Uh, well, the logo was too small. Oh, it was too small. When I first started there, the logo was like this, like on the on the shirts, and then you know progressively got smaller as the time went on. But those shirts back in the day, you can go on eBay now, and those shirts are going for hundreds of bucks, like of these original Apple Store shirts. Wow. But yeah, but I I, I don't think that they had a um, a clear path for a retail employee to become corporate. So like in my role, I was like kind of hybrid, where like I was spending half my time in the corporate office, half my time in retail. But a lot of other folks weren't weren't fortunate to be in that situation. So I think they had a pretty significant turnover, but at the same time, having Apple on your resume opens so many doors, you know? So a lot of these folks were just getting picked off by headhunters left and right. It's like, Oh, great. You worked at Apple. Great. That's going to look great on our company's masthead of like, you know, Josh Shanks, formerly of Apple. Yeah. 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 So, you know, a lot of my colleagues didn't last the six years that I lasted. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's weird, you know, to think back, like, man, if I would have stayed, I could have done this and this and this, but like, yeah, you know, I have no regrets. So Yeah, sure, sure. Well, I mean, it's to yeah, I mean, obviously hindsight's twenty twenty and to to think that you woulda, coulda, shoulda is only through hindsight, right? So yeah. you, you you'd need to have been able to predict the future had it been <laughs> the other way around. Yeah. I mean I, I left Apple shortly after the, the iPhone came out. Yeah, you know, right. I remember like if you look at photos of when the iPhone come, comes out, I can probably find one, but they had this huge press line and they had all these celebrities coming in and they used to have, I don't think I'm giving away too many secrets, but they used to have an open policy when it came to celebrities and visiting an Apple store. So if you were a celebrity and your PR prearranged it for you to visit an Apple store, you would get a certain amount of product in return for your visit, right? Wow. So like if, if you were, let's say Kanye West and you visited, you could get a laptop or you could get an iPod or whatever. And so like the number of celebrities that we had come in were, was insane. Like, I mean, right. I met everyone from like, you know, Kanye West to Alec Baldwin to um, one day, Jeff Gordon of all things, the NASCAR driver comes into like the Apple store in New York city. And I was like, what are you doing here? And he's like, dude, he's like, I'm here because no one knows who I am. Like, and no one cares about Jeff Gordon in New York city. I'm like, well, oh, good for you. That's funny. Um, well, speaking of Jeff Gordon, were you more into NASCAR given that you're an indie guy or were you more into indie? I, I think I was, so I've been to almost, you know, since I was a kid, my dad and I would go to Indy. I think my first one, my first Indy 500 
was, I want to say, 92, 93, you know, when Alan Sir Jr. won uh, that year. And then we've been going ever since. I've probably been to about 20 500s. Um, and so I was ma a massive Indy 500 fan, but I just thought that was it. I just thought that was the series of like, okay, they came every year to the Indy 500 and that was it. You didn't even realize that there's an entire program and an entire championship that, that IndyCar raced in. And then about the mid to late nineties, uh, we got super caught up in NASCAR, you know, and it was like a family tradition. You go to church on Sunday after church, you go to Taco Bell and, you know, you come home and you watch NASCAR. And it was like that ever since, uh, until I moved out, you know, I moved out out of my parents' house when I was 21. So I would say, you know, gosh, for, you know, almost two decades, basically, like it was like, you know, church, Taco Bell, NASCAR, repeat every single weekend. And, you know, I haven't been able to get NASCAR, you know, and Taco Bell into my home here. <laughs> you know, my wife is, she's okay with it. We DVR the races and I'm able to kind of watch the the highlights. And, you know, if, if we have a lazy Sunday, then I'll just put it on in the background. Who was, uh, who was your driver growing up? Was it Jeff Gordon? No, it was John Andretti. Oh, okay, sure. So John, I've always rooted for underdogs, um, and John Andretti was my favorite driver, and I think it was really because he was racing an Indy car. He was doing the double between the, you know the Indy 500 and the Coca Cola 600, um, and you know he was an underdog, and you know he, he's he's not Mario, he's not Michael, but you know he's basically Mario's nephew, and yeah, he was a phenomenal driver. He sadly passed away, um, you know, a little while back, um, but yeah, he was basically one of my heroes in nascar he drove richard petty's car the number 43 so i love that uh and then coincidentally and randomly my high school girlfriend um we were dating and we got on the topic of nascar and she's like oh you're you're into nascar i'm like yeah i'm a massive nascar fan she's like, okay well who's your favorite driver and she's like and i was like oh, john andretti she's like no you got to be kidding me i was like no it's, it's john andretti that's my that's that's who i like and she's like okay are you sure like did you know anything about me? And I'm like, well, no, we met, I think we met through school, you know? And, and she said, okay, well, I hate to tell you this, but my mom is the president of John Andretti's fan club. No kidding. I said, like, no, you're, you're kidding. Right. And she's like, no, my mom is the president of his fan club. And uh, she's like, do you want to meet him? I'm like, yeah, I, I want to meet John Andretti. And so it ends up like her mom was best friends with John Andretti. And we ended up going to, you know, the Andretti family home. He would send like a uh, bacon wrapped filet mignons every <laughs> year um, randomly. What? And I, I don't know why I remember that. And yeah, I went to a bunch of driver signings and races and everything. I met Kyle Petty. I didn't meet Richard Petty, but met Kyle Petty because he raced along with John. Uh, and yeah, it was super, super strange circumstances. That's awesome. Well, let's skip forward a little bit, I guess. You're at Wachanista now. Mm-hmm. How do you go from Apple to watch Anista? What what was that leapfrog like? So for for me, it was really transitioning from Apple to more of an IT career. You know, so I I went from Apple to working at an advertising agency doing kind of creative IT. So basically, like they had all these designers and all these um, programmers and developers, um, and they were all. It was a pharmaceutical advertising firm, so they were making all these, you know, promotional videos for pharmaceutical firms, and they were doing all the print ads for pharmaceutical firms. And so I was in my capacity there. I was doing like all the technology to back them up, basically, so that they could produce what they what they were doing. And it was all Max, so it was an easy transition from Apple to that. Um, but yeah, basically, how I got my start, you know, going from that to watches, um, was I left the advertising firm for a finance company and it was a private equity firm and i basically kind of worked my way up the ranks there but i ended up becoming the head of technology for all of their branch offices and so they had offices all around the world so they had an office in brazil an office in geneva an office in london an office in palo alto um hong kong everywhere and it was in, it, it was my charge to basically travel to each of these offices once a quarter Wow. So you're, I was traveling all over. Like I was booking around 250 to 300,000 miles a year going all just to office, 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 office. And I had a, a staff of about 10 people that reported to me that were kind of the boots on the ground, IT folks there. And then I was leading the overall strategy and implementation of all their technology. Um, but it was really, I started going to Geneva and I started going to Switzerland. And our office was in the Hermes building on Rue de Rhone in Geneva. And I was like, oh, Hermes, okay, it's a luxury brand, I know about that. But then right across the street is Patek Philippe, and then right across the water is Rolex. Oh, and then there's Tudor, and there's Breitling. And you start to see all these marquee names, and you're just like, 
okay, Swiss watches. Okay, Swiss small watches must be a thing. I'd always had watches. I, you know, I, my first mechanical watch was this little Russian Vostok watch, um, and it was a KGB souvenir watch. So it says KGB on the dial. Wow. I still I still have it in the bedroom. Um, so. I, you know, I'd always had a mechanical watch of some degree, but, you know, you always just think, okay, slap it against my wrist, the little rotor moves and it powers it. And well, that's, that was the end of my knowledge. Um, but when it was, while I was at that job, I was actually on vacation in St. Thomas and I had a watch that was a quartz watch. Um, and I went diving with it and I, I come up and the whole thing was fogged over and rusted and everything. I'm like, Oh, I've ruined this thing. Um, but I was like, maybe it's time to buy a nice watch. So I'm walking through all the duty-free stores in St. Thomas and I came across Rolex and at the time they had a full case of anything you wanted. Yeah, of course. Except I think the Daytona, but this was in 2012, you know, so, you know, you walked in there, they had the green Submariner, they had the Hulk, they had all the Submariners you wanted, any GMT you wanted. And I was like, okay, well, I was traveling a lot of the time. So this Explorer, this Explorer, you know, resonates with me. So I picked up a Rolex Explorer and I get it back. I'm back in New York. Um, I was in my office. I go to get something out of my bag and I scrape the front of the watch on my desk drawer. And it's like, okay, that's, that's a little, you know, that sucks. You know, I just got this watch. So I Google, I literally Google, I, I scratched my Rolex thinking, okay, I paid all this money for a Rolex. Why did it scratch? That's weird. You know? And I, then I found the Rolex forms. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I start to dig into the Rolex forums and there's other people that buy these watches and there's other people that there's this whole community of watch lovers. And I bought, started buying a couple more watches on the Rolex forums. And then they were doing these get togethers in Princeton and they were doing a get together in New Jersey. And I started meeting up with a few of these guys and I was like, oh, this is really cool. There's this whole community of guys that love watches. And I just kind of expected it to be a super pretentious thing. And it wasn't at all like they're just super down to earth, humble guys that just so happen to own a nice timepiece. And we got to, you know, we were meeting and we were hanging out and feel free to cut whatever you, whatever you want of this. Um, no, it's all good. We were meeting and hanging out and, you know, trading stories, trading watches, even uh, going on trips together to like Atlantic city and, and even Vegas. And I was like, okay, there's a community here. I'm, I'm building bonds. I'm building friendships. And uh, and then I fell knee deep, uh, head first into Red Bar in New York City. Sure. You know, it was started by Adam Craniotis. And I found them because I, I just opened an Instagram account for myself personally. And I found these Red Bar guys that aren't just like a one on one, hey, here's having a beer with a watch guy or here having a coffee with a watch guy that you met on the Rolex forums. These guys mean big business. Like I'm seeing all these pictures of all these watches all over a table and. It's like, what is this? Like, I need in on this. But it was like invite only. It was kind of like Fight Club. They never told you where, you know, where it happened or wh when it happened or, you know, who was there or anything like that. So I was like, I, I got to get on this. So I started DMing some of the people that I would see, you know, tagged in the pictures on the table. And it was Kathleen, Kathleen McGivney, who I DMed. And I was like, hey, so you, you go to this Red Bar thing. Can I come? And she's like, no. I was like, but I, but I like watches too. And she's like, okay. I'll have a coffee with you first and just make sure you're not a serial killer. And then, and then maybe I'll invite you. Interesting. Cool. Yeah. So I ended up, you know, attending red bar and I was attending that for a few years and it wasn't until then that, you know, I started going to way more watch events than I was going to work events and it started to overtake my life. And <laughs> yeah, it's a whole thing. That's hilarious. So then, okay. So you're at this private or private equity group. So where did the bridge cross that like, did, were you recruited by Watchanista or how did that transition? No. So the Watchanista thing was interesting. So I went from the private equity group, actually, um, they, they reshaped their business and, you know, they got out of the private equity landscape and they moved into more of a family office, which is what a lot of high net worth individuals do where like, okay, you either do investments or like if you want to have a more, you know, more steady stream of income um, that's more protected, you move into a family office. So you're protected from a tax standpoint. You can run all of your family businesses, all your homes and all your properties kind of through that wing. Um, and so they transitioned to a family office and then they actually referred me to another one of their friends that was starting a high frequency uh, trade uh, trading firm. And so they did high frequency algorithmic based trading and they needed someone to lead their technology. And so I went basically almost across the street. It was like two blocks away. You know, I left that one job on a Friday and I started the other job on a Monday. Um, and yeah, I led their technology for a few years, but it was while I was at that firm that I you know, was, I mean, I was getting watches shipped to, to the office like once a week. 
and I was just a total degenerate and I was, you know, buying a bunch of silly watches that I shouldn't, I had no business buying, but I was like buying and trading. And like, I, I would get a few nice watches and then I would like consolidate and get a, a nicer watch. Right. So like, okay. I, I got to interrupt you there, Josh, because we can't glaze over this. Like what, what kinds of watches were you buying that you shouldn't have been buying because people want to know. <laughs> so, um, when I got heavy into Rolex, I, at one time I owned the Rolex Explorer, a Rolex GMT, a Rolex Daytona, a Rolex Oyster Quartz, a Rolex Datejust, uh, a vintage Submariner 1680, uh, a semi-vintage GMT 16710. I was buying any watch that I would see on the Rolex forums that was at a reasonable price, I was like snatching it up. Okay, so it was all through the forum then. You were meeting guys that way. It was all mostly through the forums, and then I, yeah. you know, then I started to be be become a total degenerate. I was going on eBay and buying watches, and I, it was kind of you know hit or miss on eBay back then. eBay has totally changed now, which we can talk about later. But like um, back then, it was kind of the wild wild west. And you know, so what was happening is, is I would, you know, I think at one point I had a Rolex Milgauss, I had a Rolex Daytona, and I had an IWC Mark Seventeen, and I said, you know what, I want a paddock. And so back then on the Rolex forums, they had Rolex and they had all other brands. It was like, they, you, you can only be one or the other, you know? And so the guy was selling a Patek Philippe Nautilus 5711 with a white dial. And I think the retail price was $22,000. And, and so I, I messaged him on Rolex. I'm like, Hey, I've got, I've got a Daytona and a Milgauss and like 7,500 bucks. And he's like, okay, there you go. Wow. And so I shipped all my watches to him. I got a paddock. Um, and then like literally two weeks later, another guy for, you know, for $19,500 had a, a Audemars Piguet Royal Oak, um, the Ultra Thin, the 15202. Basically, I bought the two the most recognizable watches that you see on Instagram today. Uh, and I got them at, you know, under retail value back in the day. And, you know, so I was buying all these watches. And of course, uh, which leads me to okay, watches are overtaking my life. I started an Instagram account for just watches and it was called Horology and Technology. And I, I was basically, I was dating someone at the time and I had this personal Instagram account. I started taking pictures of my watches and she's like, listen, like your family's going to think, you, you know, I don't know if I can curse, but you know, your family's yeah. going to think you're, your family's going to think you're an asshole. Like don't post pictures of nice watches, like with your face and with your name. And so, okay, I'll make my own account for watches. I'll show you. Right, right, right. And so I did that. And then that account got popular because it was one of the first accounts doing watch content. Uh, it was like one of a handful of guys. And, and then I started writing about them, you know? So when I was a kid, one of the reasons that got me into Apple was that I had a Mac blog writing about Macs. It was called yourdailymac.com. And it got bought by Mac Rumors um, because one of my conditions for having my job at Apple was that I could not have a media site talking about Apple because they're a super secretive company. Right. So I sold that and I started at Apple. And then when I was at the hedge fund, I started writing about wine because I loved wine. So I've always just, I've always wrote about things that I was passionate about, you know, and and when it came to to watches, I started writing for a few magazines like IW Magazine, and um, you know, be, I became super passionate there. I was writing and just as freelance, you know, I was making a couple bucks, but you know, wasn't paying the bills by any means. Um, but it reached a point where I ended up um, I was single for a period of time, and I met this Swiss girl um, named Viviana, and she was living in Switzerland. She was working for Richemont at Mont Blanc. No kidding. Uh, we started this long distance relationship basically in late, uh, in late 2016. I'm going to, she's going to totally butcher me if I, if I don't remember the date. So it was around late 2016 and we decided, okay, let's make a go at it. Let's have a long distance relationship. And, and then she was kind of the impetus. She's like, listen, like if you love watches so much, like, why don't you just do this for a living? And I was just like, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know if I want to work for a brand or if I want to work for a media, I have no idea what I want to do. And she's like, well, you don't know until you try. You know, like you have a bit of money saved up. Like, why don't you just do it? So basically I quit my job cold Turkey. You know, I had a decent, comfortable job. Uh, I quit it. Um, and they're like, listen, you've got a non-compete. You've got all this. And, you know, they're like, we can tell that you're really into this watch thing, but like, you know, you can't work for another hedge fund because you have a non-compete and all this. I'm like, no, oh, I don't want to work in watches. That's what I want to do. And, and so, you know, kind of sounds weird, but I booked a one-way ticket to Switzerland We'd only been dating for about a month, booked a one-way ticket to Switzerland, and I stayed with her for about two months. Wow. And while I was staying with her, I was posting that I was in Switzerland, and one of 
you know, kind of my in, mutual interactions, mutual friends reached out on Instagram and he's like, what are you doing? And what are you doing in Switzerland? I'm like, well, actually it's funny. I'm dating this girl who lives in Switzerland and I don't have a job right now, but I think I want to be in the watch industry. And he's like, Oh, we should talk, you know? And that turned into watch and And that turned into me, me having uh, dinner with these guys and, you know, and really seeing their vision and seeing that, you know, a majority of their traffic was U.S. based. They wanted to have a footprint in the U.S. Um, you know, if you look at them now, they were founded about 10 years ago in Switzerland. But then it was about five years into their existence as a company, still kind of sorting out what they wanted to do as a business model. They were working with all the top watch brands. Uh, they had access because they were in Switzerland, so they knew everyone. Um, but they needed to have a footprint in the U.S. and they wanted to start a business in the U.S. And they thought that that was like the most relevant, um, you know, jumping off place for them to, you know, to expand their business. So um, we had a lot of back and forth. I developed some business plans with them. A lot of discussions about what we would do in terms of launching uh, the business in the U S and then I booked a, I, to get home from Switzerland, I booked the queen Mary and I, I took the queen Mary from London to New York. It was a no seven kidding. day, like transatlantic. It was the coolest thing I've ever done. Um, and while I was on the Queen Mary, I was, you know, starting to write my first articles, starting to further develop this business plan. And, you know, I, I remember I bought like the hundred megabyte internet package. So like I would sign on for like two minutes a day and I would send a little email, Hey, any update, any update, any update. And by the time I finally got back to New York, they're like, okay, we're going to do this. We're ready to go. We want to launch this business with you. Um, you know, when can you start? I'm like, well, I'm free now. Let's do it. And so we launched uh, Basel in 2017, basically uh, in February, March of 2017. And yeah, we've been we've been running ever since. You know, we have ten full time employees in the U.S. We have fourteen in Switzerland, um, and it's a it's a good business. And a, a lot of people know us as watching us to the media, but we're also a creative studio and agency for watch brands and retailers. So like we have two completely separate business units. Oh, that's phenomenal! If you haven't heard episode one of the Standard Age podcast, then let me tell you about my friend Tim Jackson. As owner of Passion Fine Jewelry, Tim and his team specialize in fine jewelry as well as some of the finest independent watch brands available. I'm talking about Gronfeld, Habring, Kudoki, Roger Smith, Roman Gauthier, Sarpaneva, the list goes on. The staff at Passion Fine Jewelry is literally made up of friends and family, so you will feel right at home if and when you visit. If California is out of reach, you can absolutely email or call the shop and they'll get you sorted. Visit passionfinejewelry.com for more information. As you all know, I'm a huge fan of using the right product for the right job. And like many of you, I appreciate products with a story. That's why I drive a Volkswagen GTI. It's a hot hatch with heritage. It's also why I'm into specific watches like my Tudor Black Bay. And that's exactly why I'm a fan of the indie accessory brand Contonement. Contonement makes a utilitarian cloth they simply call a kerchief. It's smaller than a standard bandana, but larger than a handkerchief, which makes it ideal to tuck in a back pocket or use as a neckerchief. I always take one on a bike ride or have one with me as a backup face covering. Not only do these kerchiefs satisfy several functions, but they look great too. Each set features illustrations celebrating icons of product design like the Omega Speedmaster, the Fender Stratocaster, or my favorite, of course, a classic GTI. Follow them on Instagram at Contonement Co. That's C A N T O N M E N T C O, or visit them at Contonement.co. And use the code STANDARD H in all caps no spaces for 20% off of absolutely everything in their online shop. Now let's get back to the show. So how, how many, I mean, I guess you would call them clients at that point, right? Like, so, so what, how many clients do you guys typically carry at one time? I mean, I, at any given time we have between 30 and 50 clients. Okay. What was your initial role then? Cause you're editor in chief now. Yeah. My initial charge was really to manage the U.S. business and start the U.S. business. So that really started with just me and my one bedroom apartment on the Upper East Side. Um, right. And it was like, okay, we need to prospect for clients. We need to build an editorial base here in the U.S. We need to build relationships in the U.S. because this business is all about relationships. It's a super small community. Uh, everyone knows each other. And so like, how can we build that? And and, and thankfully, like I I had a few friends that supported us, you know, um, uh, he passed away a couple of years back, but a gentleman named Carter, 
uh, was my first client and he was at Risty on Instagram okay. and he's the best guy in the world. And, you know, I remember when I started watching Risty, he called me and he was like, all right, I want to be your first client. What, what, what can I do? And, you know, I was like, well, what do you want? You know, and he's like, I got 2,500 bucks. You know, how, how will, will that help? I'm like, yes, that will help. You know, that'll, that'll definitely help. And sure. And then we built the business from there and it was just, you know, it was building relationships first, you know, building a qualitative editorial source for our audience and then, you know, if the relationships turned into something commercial, great. But it was, you know, I think a lot of folks in our business have the tendency to kind of hold their editorial hostage and go out and like, you have a new watch and I'm going to write about it if you give me X amount of dollars. And we're like, no, we're not going to do any of that. Like, let's build relationships. Let's do qualitative content. And if the opportunity exists to do something commercial, great. But, you know, let's, as passionate collectors ourselves, let's find a way to talk about watches the way that we want to talk about watches and the way that we want to read about watches. Totally. Yeah. I, I think, and, and this isn't me tooting my own horn by any stretch, but these kind of conversations with people like yourself on this podcast, like I wanted to just know more about the people behind it, you know? And like, obviously there's like the professional element, then there's the car thing, you know, for those with drive that double entendre, obviously with business and cars and such, but it, it, it excites me to have these types of conversations based on that. Yeah. I mean, you had Eric Koo on the other day and it's, you know, it's just so interesting to see behind the curtain. Cause I feel like we're, we're an industry that's very protected. And you know, I, I guarantee you, I've been on a variety of podcasts. I've been on clubhouse discussions and all this, but like, I've never talked about my high school girlfriend on a podcast. Mm -hmm. Like that doesn't, that doesn't happen. And, you know, right. you know, I, that's what I, you know, that's what I personally love about standard H is that you're able to kind of tell those more in-depth stories. And that's one of the things that I would always, I've always toyed with doing is like, you know, can we just do a podcast about watch guys talking about literally anything but watches? Because like every one of these podcasts, you go on there and it's like, okay, this is my new Oris and it's 72 millimeters. And I like it because of the pushers and the crowns, you know, have a gnarled finish. And we're just like, yeah, but 10 other guys did the same thing, you know? And, and not to knock that either. Like, you know, I think that there is a, there's certainly a place for that, but yeah. Yeah. I like that you're talking about the people behind the products. Oh, well, thanks. Um, was there a game plan or anything? Did anything change when you became editor in chief? Like what was, what was sort of that, the initial days, I guess. Yeah. I mean, for, for, for me, um, what I wanted was, you know, knowing that I had zero experience in the watch industry beyond being a collector and a freelance writer, whatever I got in the industry, uh, I wanted to make sure that I, that I earned it. You know, and I didn't want to come on and we see this even today, like everyone comes on like, I'm now the editor in chief of this once a year print publication, You're like, okay, well, but before that you were doing some other thing like you were, you know, um, and not to knock that, but like, at the same time, I wanted to earn it, you know, so I wanted to earn the title. You know, and and that was my whole point is, you know, you know, I've always I was raised that, you know, that hard work leads to success. And, you know, I always have found that the harder the, that I work, the more money I end up having in my bank account for some reason, you know, and um, and that's what I wanted to to do is like if I was going to become editor in chief, I really wanted to earn that title. So really, I was with the you know, with the company for over three years and my title was managing editor, but I was doing everything from you know running all their op you know running the operation in the US but also accounting I was doing payroll and healthcare and you know editorial and everything as a small business owner as you know you have to wear a lot of hats oh sure i loved that aspect of the business um, but you know now in my role as editor in chief i'm able to kind of you know take my focus shift that more towards our editorial building great products with our team we have an amazing content team so we're able to kind of sit down build great branded content projects for all of our brands and retailers but also you know kind of taking our editorial line and shifting that and thinking okay how can we kind of commercialize key opportunities um but then also how can we continue to build this business like you know there's only a finite number of watch brands in the world right there's 100 watch brands and of the 100 maybe 50 of them actually have money <laughs> you know right, so like right. you know how do you build a business when you know you're solely relying upon the watch industry so we've been doing some other some other things outside of the watch industry um my colleague marco gabella you know signed a, a brilliant thing with louis trey cognac you know working with them We've, we've been talking with a few other spirits brands and, you know, other car brands and we've got some other things in pipe. You know, we, we just made a major announcement with eBay two weeks ago. And so we're partnering with eBay as one of their, you know, almost their exclusive partner within the realm of strategy and in the realm of, you know, consulting for the luxury watch space. So um, we're just trying to do things differently. You know, that's the that whole point is that there's a lot of folks in this industry that do amazing work, you know, from Houdinki to Monochrome to Fratello, they've got great products. Um, 
but I feel like, and everyone tries to be like everyone else, you know, and at, at the right. same time, you know, you go to like an app like Watchville and it's always the same articles about the same watch with the same title and the same pictures. And we're just like, let's do things the watch in Easter way. You know, what, what, what can we do that's different? You know, and you know, our number one article series is the unlikely watch collector where we, we're, we dig into the collections of the people that, yes, uh, yeah, on the surface are entirely like watch collectors like Queen Elizabeth. But yet no one's told their stories, you know, so let's let's shine a spotlight. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you put it in those terms, because I was just talking to my wife over the weekend of just like how technology is so amazing and incredible at 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 divulging and sharing information, right? Like it's instantaneous, but I do miss those days of not even that long ago, say 15 years ago, 20 years ago, that if you were growing up in Newport beach, for example, I grew up in Raleigh, North Carolina. I can guarantee you in 1989, you and I were not wearing the same clothes. You know, we weren't wearing the same brands. You go to England you're going to see somebody completely dressed differently than if you go to Germany or Italy. And now you do see that sort of everybody's trying to be everybody because everything's gaining popularity in an instant moment and everybody knows about it instantaneously, you know, or within hours, days, a few weeks. So for trends to really pick up, be it watches, be it shoes, be it, you know, sneakers, what have you, it's like, it's really cool for that reason. But it also, I think, sincerely takes away, not to try to be negative here, but I'm just saying that you kind of lose culture as certain aspects of culture grow, if that makes any sense. Like sneaker culture is huge, but you start to see the same shoes on a multitude of different people. Whereas like, I don't know, back in the day, it used to be a lot more individualism kind of the height, the height beast mentality of it, right? Like yeah. you know, now with Instagram, it only amplifies those voices. So now that Patek Philippe that I bought and that I sadly sold, you know, at, about what I, what I paid for it. Oh, no. that, <laughs> that watch is worth like five times now what I paid for it yeah. just because of this hype beast mentality of like folks posting them to, to Instagram. And now you have all these kind of watch flippers and day traders that have kind of artificially inflated the value of these watches by passing them back and forth to each other at a rapid right. pace. You know, so it's sad because I think that we've lost the passion behind it and we've lost the passion behind what it means to be a watch collector. You know, I love any watch from a from a G-Shock up to a Grubel Force. You know, like there's a huge range of watches that we can all love. But I feel like for the broader populace, a lot of folks just look at what everyone else is doing and they say, okay, he's wearing a Rolex. Okay, I want a Rolex. Okay, Patek Philippe, that's where it's at. Yes. Okay, Audemars Piguet, great. Let's, let's buy that. Um, and they're not looking at what makes these watches intrinsically interesting and you know right. the, the intrinsic value of these watches like you know a lot of these watches aren't worth twenty five thousand dollars it's you know maybe you know about a thousand dollars in production value and all margin but sure. at the same time like there's just such a hype behind so many of these models and a lot of these you talk to the brands and they're like listen like we produce this because we love it we produce this watch because it means so much to us there are people that we produce these watches for that buy these watches and they're making more money on selling these watches than we're making on producing them. I heard, I mean, through the grapevine, I heard that FP Jorn, like Francois Paul, like himself, like just, he hates the chronometra blue. Like he, he doesn't even like the watch anymore because of kind of what you're saying. And it's like, I think the second that these things became investments, it turned into money grabbing as opposed to like the intrinsic value or the emotional purchasing you know, it's no longer emotional, only of the, the emotion lies in the upside of the monetary value, not like the emotional intrinsic value or the mechanical, like, you know, even just like the technological value of it, you know? Yeah, because you can make the world's most advanced watch and it just falls on deaf ears and some guy wants a three hand stainless steel watch with an integrated bracelet just simply because he read about it here or there or saw some guy on Instagram post it, you know? And yeah. meanwhile, there's this amazing Swiss artisan that's made a minute repeater using his bare hands and made every screw and bridge and everything on that thing. And he's like, okay, no one cares. You know, great. Yeah. They just want to, they want to sub, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, it may be, and maybe things will, will shift, you know, the, the tide, is is high maybe now and maybe it'll start to go out <laughs> who knows but i think we're seeing that we're seeing it shift away from brands because one i think it's shifting because 
there's just such a limited supply, right? And there's so much yeah. pent up demand that that right. pent up demand is going into other brands. And, you know, these brands like Gerard Perigo and Vacheron Constantin and Chopard, they're actually getting a lot more interest because people literally, no matter how hard they try, can't buy these highly coveted watches, but they're the fallback option, but they're actually making great products. Like the Vacheron Constantin over, overseas is, is an amazing watch. Sure. The, the Chopard Alpine Eagle is actually, it got a lot of hate when it came out, but now you look at it and you give it a second look and you're like, it's actually not too bad. You know, it's, they're doing some really cool things with metallurgy and they're the dials, these like Chopard loop dials that they're producing. It's like kind of starburst textured dials. They're gorgeous. Yeah. They're beautiful. So people are getting more and more interested in into these kind of models simply because they can't get that thing. But once they learn more about the other brands that exist, like that, you know, the the doors are being open. Like I didn't discover Vasher on Constantin until I listened to Rick Ross, you know, and Rick Ross and the song was like, you know, you know, I think he had this lyric that goes like Vakaran on my wrist a year ago. I didn't know this uh-uh, exists, you know, and and I was like, oh. Oh wow, Rick Ross, Vacheron, Bach- and and I was in Geneva at the time working, and I walked by the the Vacheron Constantin manufacturer on this island, and then you start reading about them, and you when you if you're a collector and you start getting into these watch brands, you start to understand their history and their passion and the craftsmanship that goes into it, your mind is just blown. Like you know, the more that more brands that you can discover, the better. I say. Totally, totally. What um what kind of challenges have you faced during COVID? I mean, obviously you got into your new role like right in the thick of it all, like September ish, right? So what uh what kind of challenges have you had to face, if any? Yeah, no, I mean I think it was you know, the role was like a long time kind of coming and then we finally kind of came to a good moment because it, we didn't want to announce it right around COVID. We I felt that, that would be a little bit too insensitive. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, when COVID hit, man, it was I remember we were we were on a photo shoot at Audemars Piguet. We're at their boutique and we're shooting this new piece. Uh, I was scheduled to come out like the next week and like everyone was like a little weird and skittish and everyone was on this side of the room and we're photographing and there's like, yeah, let's just do this next week. I think we're gonna have to shut down for a couple of days. I'm like, okay, well, great. We'll just do it next week. See you then. And uh, and then yeah, we shut down our office March 13. We haven't been back. Um, so we've all been working remotely, our entire team, which, I mean, it took us a while to kind of find a good rhythm to work together. I mean, Zoom and Slack and, you know, email, of course, everything really helped us to kind of evolve. But honestly, last year was a record year for Watchinista, despite everything, knock on wood. No kidding. It was a record year for us. And I think it was really so many brands pivoted uh, away from print and into digital. And then on top of that, content is king. And as a content studio, as watching these creative studios, we were working with all these brands in the middle of COVID because we were one of the only shops open that was producing content that they're going to like, listen, like I have a social media campaign coming up next week. Can you guys shoot my new piece? Like, no problem. Bring it in, you know, and oh, great. You know, I'm a retail store and I'm doing a small activation and I want to do an event at, at a pop up in a COVID safe way. No problem. We can do that. You know, so it was really just having the flexibility and you know, being able to adapt our business to, to meet the demands of these brands and, and retailers. So what kind of strategies then do you use for like reader acquisition? Like how do you fetch those eyeballs? So that's, that's the, that's the kind of the hardest thing because there is only a finite number of eyeballs within the watch world. Yeah. I think if you look at any given time, there are only a few thousand actual top end collectors that would want to consume this data on a daily basis. And that's what we all take for granted. When we see a guy wearing a Rolex or a paddock, we think he's a watch guy, but nine times out of 10, you're like, Hey man, nice watch. It's like, Oh God, what, what are you, what are you looking at? Like, why are you looking at my watch? You know? So like we take that for granted and we think that everyone is into watches like we are, but really it's like 0.1% of the 1% of the watch industry that makes up the luxury industry. Right. So like, if we were able to kind of move that needle from 1% to 2%, it would be huge. Right. So in terms of watching Easter, what we really try to do during COVID is find a way to, you know, to keep that connection open, you know? So we started this home time live. So we were doing Instagram lives with everyone from Jean-Claude Bivet to um, uh, Christophe Granger at IWC. And we were doing these home time live Instagram sessions once a day during COVID. And so for three months, every single day we had an IG live. And, you know, I see you on live too. And I know that that, you know, it's kind of an overwhelming medium at times, um, but we were doing a structured live broadcast every single day, regardless of the day. And we were promoting that. And we did that for the first three months of the pandemic. Um, But then, you know, social media has been key for us. You know, so when I started, I think we were around like 60,000 Instagram followers. We've grown it now to about 126,000. The account's verified. Everything's been organic. Like we haven't, you know, 
paid for a single like or follow or anything. Like it's all been organic growth. Incredible. And our re- our readership has really been the same way. It's like, you know, why go out there and buy traffic or buy, you know, pay for a bunch of promotional things to drive traffic? Like, let's just find a way to gradually and build our organic fan base. We know we're not number one. We know who number one is and they do a great job. Um, and we don't want to be them, but how can we build it in, in a way that's authentic to us? And, and so we've been able to kind of, uh, you know, authentically grow that we've, you know, tried to improve our SEO, tried to improve our website. I think on the public facing side, it looks great. I think on my mind and my critical mind, I'm like, okay, I want to change this and this and this, it's never perfect, you know? Right. Right. So there's a lot of things that we want to do there. Um, but really the the saving grace for us has been, you know, our brand partners, our retail partners, and then now new channel partners like eBay. Yeah. So what's that relationship then? So with, with eBay, we have partnered with them on um, a long-term strategic partnership with eBay to help them evolve eBay watches and eBay in the world of luxury watches and luxury watchmaking. So you know, our bread and butter business is really our brand partners and our retail partners. And so by any stretch of the means, eBay is not joining us as a retail partner. You know, our biggest MO since we founded Watchinista, it's not, I say we, I say, um, you know, Marco Gabella and Alexander Friedman founded Watchinista. Um, I just started the U.S. portion of the business. Sure, sure. But when that was founded, it was really, we're not going to be a selling platform. We're not going to sell watches, right? So how can we exist in our medium without selling watches? And, but the idea is, is that we exist to, you know, basically preach the virtues and the values of watches and watchmaking, and then help further education of those fields for collectors. And with eBay, I think that there was always this kind of stigma behind buying a watch on eBay, right? It's like, is it fake? Is it, um, is it aftermarket? Uh, I don't know this guy. It's some random guy. Am I going to get scanned by some guy in Nigeria with this watch? I don't know, right? And so I think that they tried to remove all the guesswork out of that. And they launched this authentication program where they can basically use this third party solution where if you buy a watch on eBay, it's sent to this third party prior to you receiving it. And the watch is completely gone through to make sure every single component on it is authentic before it reaches your desk. And if it's not authentic, it goes right back and you get your money back because your money's held in escrow. Got it. So I guess a major point of concern then I'm just speaking objectively here, right? What's to prevent this third party from swapping parts or doing this, that, and the other, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, they would probably lose their biggest contract that they have, but the third party is, um, you know, we, we know the gentleman that I, I personally know who this person is. So it's not sure. a person. It's a whole team. Obviously eBay sells thousands of watches by the day. I think they're the largest watch seller in the world, right? They are. Yeah. yeah. I think if you look at it by the numbers, they're the largest watch seller in the world. Yeah. Um, so they have this authority and right now the service is only us based. They've been very cautious with their vendors that they select. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it would be a, you know, a catastrophic event if, uh, if, uh, if a component was changed out, but they, they don't exist to change components. They exist to examine components. So like they're not taking the dials and the hands off these watches yeah. to service them by any means. So the watches, right. you know, aren't, they're, are, they're authenticated, but not service. So they're not like going in and changing rotors or changing anything like that. So, um, you know, and I think that it would be a, a big thing if something like that were to happen, but yeah, you know, that the way that, I understand the business to work is that they exist to authenticate, to verify, make sure everything's, you know, a hundred percent correct before it goes to the end consumer. Cool. cool. So what, uh, so for you, what's gotten the most risk time during COVID? Have you been, has it been a steady rotation or is, have you been kind of like a, well, I, I really have no reason to wear a watch. That's the weird <laughs> thing. You know, it's, it's most days I don't, you know, I have a watch on my desk in case I have a zoom call and I have to be the watch guy, you know, like, <laughs> normally it's, I picked up a, a Speedmaster Moonwatch um, about m- midway through quarantine. Um, when I started to hear these rumblings, like, they're going to come out with a coaxial version of this. Like, you should buy the old version. And so I bought the previous version of that prior to the new one that came out a few months back. I love it. And I, I, I would say that's gotten the most risk time. And the other one is really a Yema rally graph. These little Yema pieces. It's a French watchmaker that founded back in the 60s, and they were making racing watches. Um, and I discovered them at Basel World a few years back. And, you know, they're a super cool manufacturer. They make everything from these mecha quartz, quartz watches that are around a few hundred bucks, all the way up to full mechanical watches with, um, 
Lamagna movements and with Edda movements and uh, Valju movements, even like they're doing a lot of really cool things and they're reinvigorating, reinvigorating a lot of these past models that they had and they're refreshing them for, you know, the modern day. So the Yemma rally graph was probably like my most worn watch of quarantine because it was you know, super accessibly priced. I could beat it up do whatever i wanted with it and it just always gave me that feeling of having a watch on without having to worry about like you know there's a lot of watches in my collection that i almost worry about wearing now because you you know you can't help but think of the secondary value of these things and you don't want to bang them up on a desk or you don't want to scratch them or you know you're not going to walk your dog with these watches so so what's on your wrist right now is it the speedy no this is actually a oris uh williams chronograph so at one point Oris was the uh, the primary sponsor of Williams F1 team, and yeah. they were for years. And they made a, a line of a collection of watches. And before they discontinued their partnership two years ago, I called VJ at Oris, and I was like, "I need I need one of these Williams watches before you guys discontinue them." And he was able to able to hook that up. Well, and especially now that Williams was sold, obviously, like that. Yeah, there's a couple different things there. That's cool. I've never seen one of those. That's really cool. Yeah, so the Williams collection was really cool. I love Oris as a brand. I think it's yeah, kind of like watching Easter, right? Like what you see is what you get. I hopefully we come across as fairly humble dudes that just really love watches. We totally. like having a good time, and and that's what Oris is all about too. It's like a watch yeah. brand that you can have a beer with, right? And there's very few of those. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, I mean I think it's great. I think you know uh, James Stacy and Jason from the Gray NATO. They've they've covered those guys quite a bit, and. Um, yeah, they just seem like the real deal, the Oris guys. I've obviously never met them, but um, they seem like a lot of fun. Yeah, no, I've been every year, at least until COVID, they would, they would do this kind of annual summit for the press in Vail, Colorado. Yeah, in Vail, yeah. With James and, and Jason and, you know, all the other characters from the watch world. And it it's only like a one and a half day trip, but the entire thing feels like a week. Like oh. you have so much fun and you burn the candle at both ends for sure. But like it is like... I don't know. I don't know how to explain it, but it's like one of the most immersive experiences, but also one of the most fun press trips that you can go on. And and hopefully if we learn anything from COVID, it's that like we don't need to fly all over the world to see new watches, but like give us cool experiences and let us like really be, you know, let's do something different with all of our colleagues. So that's incredible. I mean, obviously, you probably saw my jaw hit the floor when you said it's only a day and a half, like just based on the content that I see on Instagram and the storytelling and everything. Yeah, it sounds like that trip would be no less than four days. <laughs> it's a day and a half. That's insane. You arrive, you have a dinner, the next day you have a product presentation, and then everyone goes into breakout groups. Maybe you go skiing or snowmobiling, um, and then you have a dinner, and usually a very late night at a bar, and then the next day you fly out, and that's it. Wow. Oris does a phenomenal job with that, um, you know, and that's something I look forward to every year. Uh, but also, like, you know, hopefully this year there's this big trade show called Couture in Vegas, and that's supposed to happen in August. I'm hoping to God that like, we're actually able to physically gather because we have a tradition with, um, with all the watch guys, myself, Adam Craniotis. Um, hopefully we can get some of the Houdinki guys out, but we go to slots of fun in Las Vegas and play beer pong before the show starts every year. And we play beer pong and eat Noble Romans breadsticks. And it's like, like one of the other points on my calendar that I look forward to every year. That's incredible. No. Yeah. Do you have any, uh, future acquisitions on the, on the calendar for, for 2021? I mean, I'm I'm still on like 18 lists for a Rolex Daytona, but I'm not <laughs> I'm not nearly a big enough client at any of these people. Um, Which one? I want a white dial. I want the Panda. Sure. The white dial with the the black registers. Um, and let's see what Rolex comes out with this year, because that might be something else that I get on a wait list that I that I don't get. Yeah. And I, you know, again, like the whole wait list thing, like it's the wait lists are not chronological, no matter how you slice it. Like it's all about your purchase history and it's all about your relationships. And I've never wanted to play that card of like, Hey, I work in watches. Like, give me this watch. Like, no, like I want to earn it. Right. Right. The other thing that my wife is on the list for the new Omega uh, Snoopy. Oh, cool. New, the new Snoopy piece. Um, and Oris has got some cool things coming out this year. And I put my name on a couple of them and hopefully I get it. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, and let's see, Watches and Wonders is coming up in like two weeks. So that's when all the new watches are going to come out. Sure. I want to eventually add an IWC. I want to get an IWC Pilots, Pilots watch, like probably a Pilot Chrono. Oh, okay. Is it like the, um, 
was it the Heritage Collection? What was the one that came out like a couple years ago? It was like a 40 or 41. What did they call it? The Spitfire. Excuse me. The Spitfire Collection. Spitfire is super cool. Yeah. And so like I would, you know, one, because I love aviation, I could totally do a Spitfire. But I think yeah. you know, looking at the evolution of the Pilots Watches, I think IWC has done a great job of positioning their brand to be accessible at any price point. You know, if you want a four grand Pilots Watch, awesome. We've got that. If you want a perpetual calendar, cool. 40 grand. We've got that too. And, uh, and they're one of those brands that's slowly kind of coming out of their cave and like they're being more accessible and they're on Instagram live and they're on clubhouse and they're on these other mediums. And, you know, they're kind of, you know, opening their doors for people to kind of come in and give them feedback, which I think we are going to need for the future of the watch industry for the, a lot of these kind of hardened Swiss folks to understand what people actually want to buy. Yeah. IWC was the first, uh, watch brand that I was like, I don't know. It just, it, it hit different. Like I, I had just moved to LA in 2007, walking up Rodeo drive. Then on the side street, it was like Panerai IWC, which has since moved. But I just, I, the IWC just spoke to me in a way that no other watch brand. I mean, obviously I was very familiar with Rolex and you know, you saw those everywhere to, you know, if anybody had a nice watch, it was probably a Rolex. Um, and yeah, I just, the first watch I was just, that was involved a comma in the price tag, uh, was the Portofino chronograph. That was like the first one. And I didn't even know it was like the cheapest or the least expensive, I guess is the, the way I should say that chronograph that IWC made. But for whatever reason, just the layout, the, the proportions of the dial, the aesthetic, that sort of sporty, but like kind of an elegant case. I, it just, it, I don't know. I was 27 years old and I was like in love with that watch. And then finally, like f 10 years later, I got it. So <laughs> do you still have it? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I wear it from time to time. And, and now that I have multiple watches, it doesn't get as much wrist time as it did when I first bought it. But, um, yeah, the IWC, I just think what Chris has done and, you know, given his architecture background and such and, even just the design that he did of the, of their home office is just, it's insane. Like everything they do is just so good. I mean, not to say other brands don't obviously like uh, along in Sona is another brand and another CEO there that like is just a mastermind. I just love everything they do. Yeah. And you know, and, and that's the thing, a lot of these pieces like the Odysseus at Longa, like when that was released, like, it got so much hate and, and then now people are understanding it and they're like, you know what, this thing is like super desirable and now you can't find them anywhere, you know? And yeah, um, yeah and I, I love what, I love what IWC does. And you know, it's, it's, it's also like they market based on experience too. Like whether, you know, I, I was able to lucky enough to be able to go to Austin for the F1 race with, with IWC and Mercedes oh, amazing. a few years back. And I, I was, you know, I got the opportunity to interview Lewis Hamilton, you know, it was super cool. Incredible. You know, but for their customers, they're able to get those same experiences. And, and also like, if you walk into a, an IWC boutique 90% of the time, you're not gonna be shown any watches. You're gonna talk, you're gonna sit, you're gonna have a coffee, you might have a whiskey. And 90% and of your time there, you're gonna talk about anything but watches. And you're gonna talk about your life and you're gonna talk about your experiences, your taste, your music. And then I guarantee you, they're gonna bring out a watch that resonates with you. You know, yeah. that's what I like about it. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I love that they have, you know, boutique editions that are specific and, and all that kind of stuff that, uh, yeah, I mean, what, what more can you say really? They're just knocking it out of the park left and right. What, um, you're, you're in Connecticut now, you're not living in the city anymore. What's your daily driver? Are you still just riding the train or, or what are we driving these days? <laughs> we drive a Volkswagen Beetle convertible turbo. No kidding. Named Bert. <laughs> uh, Bert the Beetle, named after Bert Reynolds, and uh, yeah, my wife and I bought it. If you know, my wife, that girl that I was dating in Switzerland, she's now my wife. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we bought it a couple years back, and you know, we were living on the Upper East Side. We didn't have a whole lot of money, um, but we wanted to get out. We wanted to escape, and we wanted to you know go on go on some trips together. So uh, we were visiting my folks in Indiana. We picked up the car um, and drove it off a lot. The engine blew up had to have the entire engine replaced. Uh, luckily Volkswagen did the entire thing. Um, was that common in those cars? Like I, why did it blow up? Do you know? Yeah. I mean, I've heard the, you know, I've heard it's a 1.8 liter turbo and I've heard they've had a lot of issues. And for, for us, like there was just so many metal fragments and metal shards in the engine. It was pre-owned, you know, it had like 
you know, a few thousand miles on it when we got it, but it was by no stretch of the imagination, high mileage. Um, but all the sensors were blown up on this thing. And so they replaced the sensors top to bottom about five times until they finally relented. And they're like, all right, well, you you're covered under warranty. So we're going to replace the entire engine. Uh, so they replaced the engine top to bottom. So we basically have a brand new car. So I'm kind of like, I keep looking, I have such envy. I look at Tesla's and I want to buy, you know, we were looking at like a, an Audi Q5 SUV because uh, we have a dog now and we want to have kids. And uh, eventually I want to buy a, you know, vintage car, but I want to be able to have a garage so I can tinker on it myself. And yeah. we just don't have that. And so for still the fact that like we're in, you know, we're in an apartment, we have a parking garage that we park it in. Um, it's been a great car, man. I mean, we, now, after we got the engine replaced, it's been great, I should say. But like we we <laughs> did two years ago, we did Route 66. Oh, nice. So we we drove literally the old the old alignments on Route 66. So we avoided all the highways and we drove from uh, Chicago to Santa Monica. Wow. The three week trip. It was that was one of the best road trips I've ever had. And my parents, when they moved to California from Indiana, they took my dad's 68 Le Mans um, and they drove from Kokomo, Indiana to, to Long Beach, California, where they lived. And we wanted to kind of retrace the, their steps. And my mom had this photo album full of all their old photos from the trip. So we took that with us and we recreated a lot of their pictures. Oh, that's amazing. And so we were like holding up this old vintage image of my dad in front of his Le Mans. And it's like me in front of my beetle, you know, it was so fun. Um, and then last year we did a national parks trip where again, we went from New York city all the, to basically we visited about 10 national parks, ended up in Palm Springs, and then drove back and this was in the middle of the pandemic so we we camped and so we basically took our little beetle packed it full of camping gear and we camped at all these national parks it was it was awesome that's incredible seems like you're ahead of the curve on that too probably My, we've always traveled and you know especially for work and personal and you know we were like well we got to do something i guess we have this time we might as well spend it and yeah right. but now i mean this was before masks this was i, I think it was like may or june of, of last year and so like we're walking through these national parks people are calling us sheep and all these names we're like we're just trying to be safe like this is what we do in new york city you know like but it was it was a wild time that's crazy well man this has been a lot of fun is there anything else you wanted to promote or talk about no i mean we i think we covered all the bases we we covered watchanista it's a great destination and source for for watch lovers um um, we, we got some really cool projects coming up this year. Hopefully we can get back on the racetrack too. Um, that yeah. was really cool that we got to go racing with you last year yeah, uh, was in NASCAR, yeah. uh, kind of a dream come true for me. Uh, and that's it. I think we covered it a lot. That's awesome. Josh, I can't thank you enough for taking the time, man. Uh, it's really great to chat. Um, obviously I'll keep you posted on anything and everything. Stay tuned and, and I'll keep in touch via email. Cool. Thanks Wes. Okay, buddy. Talk to you later. Thanks. I'd like to thank Josh once again, and thanks to all of you for listening. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the show, and while you're there, if you don't mind rating and even leaving a short review, it helps way more than you think. Please give Standard H a follow on Instagram, at Standard H underscore, as well as the podcast page, at Standard H underscore podcast. Shout out to Jensen Reed and Super Beautiful for the theme track as well as the clear audio for the noise-canceling headphones. Stay tuned for the next episode of the Standard Age podcast in two weeks' time. Thanks again for listening.